How are we doing, church? Doing okay? All right, good to see all of you. If you're brand new to us, we're glad you're here. My name is Josh. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here. And uh, it's so good to have you guys with us today. Uh, I'm excited to start a brand new series, but before we get into that series, I want to give you guys a couple of quick updates. Uh, if you haven't noticed, things are a little bit different. Things are changing around here. Uh, there's this big new building going up behind us, behind me, and uh, we're excited for that. So thank you. I just want to say thank you guys for uh, adjusting and going with the flow here the next couple of weeks. So what's going to happen is we're going to be in this space right here uh, for a couple of weeks while this space uh, it's going to be a little bit different each week. Uh, just so you know, this space is getting converted into the lobby that it's always wanted to be, all right? <laughs> this place was always designed to be a lobby, and uh, so we're excited for that. So I think this week, actually, they're building a vestibule in this corner, so if this is your corner where you sit, you're going to have to find a slightly different spot to sit this week. Uh, just some minor, minor things like that over the next couple of weeks, and uh, everything with the building is still on schedule. It's going to be here quicker than we realize uh, the builder is telling us that we'll have occupancy by September 24th, which is less than two weeks away. Hard to believe. Yeah, that's so exciting. <laughs> Crazy. Um, obviously, we have a lot to do still before then. And also, once we have occupancy, there's still several weeks of things that we need to do. So we'll be letting you guys know. Stay tuned. If you don't get our email, let us know. We'll put you on our email list. Uh, we'll be letting you know when the transitions are coming in the next couple of weeks, but just super exciting to see all that God is doing. Uh, we couldn't be more excited for that. Um, then I want to share one more uh, update with you guys. Uh, I'm super excited about our student ministry here at Evident. Uh, student ministry is grades 6 through 12, and we're, we're kicking off, having our fall kickoff for student ministry, uh, and we have a great fall plan for our students. I have a 7th grader, I have a ninth grader in our student ministry right now, which is, is blowing my mind. But, um, but I'm so excited about what God's doing in our student ministry. And uh, our leaders, uh, Lisa Matway and our friend Pastor Jason Fulham, they shot a quick video for us to let us know about the, uh, the kickoff coming up. So go up and watch this. Hi, I'm Jason. And I'm Lisa. And we've got some really exciting news for you, church family, on Wednesday, September 15th. We are launching our student ministry kickoff at Walter and Mary Berg Park and from 6.30 to 8. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be I'm amazing. So excited. I know. We want your students there. Mm -hmm. Tell them to bring their friends. We're going to have food. We're going to have games. The weather's going to be perfect because mm -hmm. we prayed about it. Yes, we have. Right? It's mm -hmm. going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. So, hey, Evident Church, you mm -hmm. need to come out. Tell your students. Let them know we want them there. Parents, you can go have a date night while your students have a great time. That's right. And just to make sure um, any friends you bring that they're in grades 6 through 12. And we would love to have you. We can't wait to see you there. See you there. All right. Bye. Can we give Pastor Jason and Miss Lisa a hand? Appreciate them. Uh, so uh, student ministry kicks off again this Wednesday. They meet weekly, uh, normally here at the church from 630 to 8. Grades 6 through 12. Their kickoff is this Wednesday where? Walter Maryburg Park in downtown New Baltimore. Uh, from 6.30 to 8, it's going to be a great time. And so two ways that you guys can help us. Uh, if you are a parent and you have kids in grades 6 through 12, uh, I want to encourage you to get your kids to Evident Student Ministry. Uh, there's nothing that we can do as a church to help your students unless you get them there, Right. Um, so get them there, help, help them to get there and uh, to be a part of Evident Student Ministry. Um, I think that's such a crucial time. Uh, my kids, you know, I would encourage you to maybe follow my example. Uh, your pastor uh, sees it a priority to have, not just because it's our, my church, okay, because I get the pastor here, but I believe in student ministry. I would encourage you to do the same thing and get your kids there for that. Um, then also, uh, if you are interested at all, like I mean at all, in helping to volunteer with our students, uh, we could use about three to five more uh, adult volunteer or like leaders. Yeah, there we go. That's the right word. Leaders uh, to be part of our student ministry. You won't have to teach unless you have the gift of teaching and want to, but just have other adult leaders there to help welcome kids when they come to, uh, to play some of the fun games they play and to be a part of student ministry. We need especially uh, women because we are very heavy in the female category. I contributed two of those, but... <laughs> Uh, so we've got lots of, of uh, young girls in our junior high. We have several uh, uh, ladies in our senior high. And so if you are all interested, come find me after service, talk with me. 
uh, we could use more people uh, to help shape our, our children, our, our students moving forward. So uh, then lastly, I just want to say thank you so much to, uh, to just you as a church. Uh, your generosity in this season is, is so important and so huge. Um, you guys have done amazing this past year. And we'll talk more about the all-in stuff in the future. If you were here a few months ago, you know about that. But your giving has just been amazing, and I just want to thank you for that. Um, we can move forward with confidence in this next season because of your generosity. And so I'm just excited God is doing so many great things. So uh, we can give, give, give yourselves a hand for your giving this last couple months. It's been awesome. All right. All right, so if, would you guys please uh, stand with me again? I know you just sat down. Stand with me again. We don't do this every Sunday. We give you some breaks, but we are going to read God's Word. And I do think it's important to recognize uh, that we're not just reading random words, but these are the words that God has given to us. We recognize the power of God's Word. And so um, I'm going to read this from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is our main passage for today, and it's going to be on the screen for you as well. Um, Paul wrote this. He said, we thank, I'm sorry, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought that we would never live through it. Doesn't it at times feel like these seasons we're in right now? It's like, I'm not sure we're ever going to make it through these. Uh, in fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves, and we learned to rely on on God, the same God who raises the dead, and he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. So let's pray, ask God to be with us. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is alive and active. Holy Spirit, we recognize your presence in this place, and we just want to ask that you would speak to us. God, even surprise us. If we came in a little bit jaded and callous today, I pray that you'd surprise us and speak to us uh, according to your grace that is at work within us. We give you this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. So today we're starting a brand new teaching series uh, called Coffee Mug Christianity. Uh, within the Christian, you know, bubble, we've got lots of sayings and lots of things that we, we love to throw around, these little kind of cliche things that we you hope kind of summarize an aspect of, of truth. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to see, though, uh, what are some of the cheesiest Christian coffee mugs that I could find um, on the internet? <laughs> and so I, I found a few of these. I want to share these with you guys. So here's the first one. Uh, how does Jesus make his coffee? He brews it. Uh, that, that's classic. That's classic. We've got another one here for you. Uh, do you need an ark? Because I know a guy. <laughs> and that, and they, they're all kind of like grown worthy, basically. They are. Uh, go ahead and go to the next one. Um, I, I, would, <laughs> I, I would hate drinking out of this coffee mug. I saw that like every single time. I feel like, feel like instant like shame and conviction every time. Um, <laughs> All right, Jesus saves. I think that's kind of funny. His, his jersey says heaven on it, basically. Um, that's funny. I like this one, though. This is my favorite one. <laughs> I would drink out of this coffee mug. It'd be hot, lukewarm hot chocolate, but I would drink out of this coffee mug. Uh, those of you who don't know text lingo, what does BRB stand for? Be right back. Be right back. I love that. If someone wants to buy me that mug, they can. This is, a, this is Moses and his father-in-law, Jethro, fishing. And Jethro says, Moses, knock it off. <laughs> he's parting the water where he's trying to fish. And then this next cup is worthless, but it says Cam and GJ Sunday morning on it. So Cam and GJ Sunday morning. <laughs> we should be. We should be selling those, yeah, raising money for the, the building project. But, um, so Christian cliches. These are oftentimes thrown around at times when we don't know what to say or we want to put a, a sticker on, a, you know, on the back of our car. But let me, let me say a few of them and see if you can fill in the blank. Uh, first one is this. When God closes a door, he opens a window. <laughs> you guys are well-versed. What does that even mean? We don't know, but, but we say it. Uh, another one, cleanliness is next to godliness. Nowhere in the Bible, just so you all know. Uh, next one is God helps those who help themselves. We're indoctrinated, aren't we? <laughs> So a lot of these are humorous, but the problem can be that they're actually, they can actually be very, very dangerous, right? Because many of them uh, contain an element of truth, but they also aren't necessarily the whole truth. 
Um, Ben Franklin, the great theologian Ben Franklin, uh, he said a half-truth is often, what? A great lie. Another author said a half-truth is even more dangerous than a lie. A lie you can detect at some stage, but a half-truth is sure to mislead you for a very long time. And it's been said throughout history that the most dangerous heresies, false beliefs or false teachings, are those that are half-truths because we're easily deceived by them. And we've got lots of these, even in our culture, right, that we could easily be deceived by, but we're going to tackle some of these uh, Christian cliches. So today we're going to tackle a common one, and that is this phrase, that God will never give you more than you can handle. God will never give you more than you can handle. That sounds good, doesn't it? The problem is, I'm not sure if it's true, Mother Teresa said this. She said, I know God will never give me more than I can handle. I just wish he didn't trust me so much. (laughs) See, it sounds really good. It'd be really nice if we could say, you know what, whatever I'm going through, I know that I can make it through this because God has promised to never give me more than I can handle. The problem is it's just not true. Yes, I just said Mother Teresa was wrong. (laughs) I'm not sure how I feel about that. But what we want to do is look at Scripture and go to Scripture. And the truth is, you will often experience more than what you in your own strength and own power can handle. And that's where this Christian cliche uh, gets it wrong. It makes us believe that we should be able to handle this in and of ourselves. And God never promised that. In fact, oftentimes in Scripture, we see examples of people being dealt hands of more than they can handle. I think of Adam and Eve. I'm going to go back to just the very beginning or start right there. Uh, The very first human beings, Adam and Eve, and they have two sons. And we think this garden, like idyllic relationship and family, but even the very first family, two brothers, sibling rivalry, what does one brother do to the other brother? He kills him. The very first family. How dysfunctional is that, right? Can you imagine, though, how overwhelming for Adam and Eve to know that you have two sons and they can't get along to the point where one takes the other son's life? I bet that was a little bit overwhelming beyond what they could bear. Um, I think of Moses' mother. We don't know her name in Scripture, but the mother of Moses. And in a time of, of genocide... The, Pharaoh Egypt, uh, the Egyptian pharaoh was killing all the Hebrew baby boys. And in a moment of, of desperation, she takes her young son, puts him in a basket, and drops him in the Nile River. To, to Hopefully that will save his life. Talk about something that is overwhelming and you can't handle. I don't think we'd want to say to her, God will never give you more than you can handle. Uh, I think of Job. And in a moment, Job lost it all. He lost all of his wealth. He lost his entire family except for his wife in a single day. I can't imagine what that would be like. And we would not go to Job and say, God said he'll never give you more than you can handle. See, it just isn't true. And I think that you could share stories of your own of a time or a season or Um, a moment or something that happened where you're just like, I can't bear this any longer. So we're not going to perpetuate that half-truth. So where does this idea come from, though? This idea comes from something Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to take a look at it real quick to see if it says what people think it says. So 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, um, you can turn there. It'll also be on the screen for you. Paul said, the temptations in your life are no different from what other people experience. And God is faithful. Here's where we get off the rails. He will not allow, you, allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. The question is, we're going to get to in a second, what is meant by temptation? What is he referring to? When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure it. So when people say this phrase to people, they're usually talking to people who are enduring incredible difficulty and pain and saying, and they mean, they're well-intentioned trying to encourage them, God will never give you more than you can handle, but is that what this passage is referring to? So in order to understand what the passage is meaning, we have to understand the context, and the word temptation can mean a couple of things. It can mean a temptation to sin, it can mean a trial, or it can mean any type of suffering. 
But what is the context? We got to look at the broader context. Um, so context determines meaning. For example, if you see the word T-E-A-R, you need to see it in context to know what it's referring to, don't you? I didn't even want to pronounce it because I could pronounce it one way or it could be pronounced a different way. It could be pronounced tear or it could be pronounced tear. It can mean ripping something in two. It can mean running really fast down a hallway or it could mean having a really good cry, couldn't it? So context determines meaning. In the context surrounding 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is talking to the church, and he's challenging them uh, to not fall into the temptation of idolatry and sexual immorality. So his, the context is about temptation towards sin and not toward trials and difficult situations. When, when people take those words about temptation and apply them to trials and temptations, that actually the statement's not true. In fact, the opposite is true. God often does allow or give us more than we can handle on our own. Uh, we're going to take Paul's example that he gave us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So if you want to flip that, that's our main passage this morning. So the passage we read clearly shows us that God may give some people more than they can handle. I'll just remind you what Paul said. Paul said we were crushed and overwhelmed. What does it say? Beyond our ability to endure. There you go. And we thought that we would never live through it. That sounds a little bit overwhelming, doesn't it? In fact, we expected to what? To die. I don't know if you've ever been overwhelmed to that point, but that's pretty desperate, isn't it? That's pretty overwhelmed. So why would God do this? Let's look at the rest of that verse. It says, but as a result, what does it say? We stopped relying on ourselves and we learned to rely on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. So the truth is, God gives us more than we can handle so that we will depend on him. So we'll depend on him. So is it true that God will never give you more than you can handle? It's not, is it? The truth is, you will go through things that you cannot handle on your own. Why would God do this? so that you will turn to him and learn to rely on him. So next time you're going through a challenge, don't, don't try to prop yourself up and say, man, I, I have to be able to handle this. God said I, would, I should be able to handle this. Just acknowledge, God, I can't handle this. That's a good place. To, it's, it's actually a good place to be. It's a good place to start. God, I can't handle what I'm going through. And that opens up the door so that you can begin to rely on God. Um, here's more from Paul's personal experience. This is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, this is from a version of the Bible known as the message. It's a paraphrase, not word for word, but it gives us some good imagery. So Paul said this. He said, so I wouldn't get a big head. I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch, what does it say, with my limitations. We want to distance ourselves from limitations. Paul said, God gave me a gift that kept me well in touch with my limitations. Satan's angel did his best to get me down, but what he did was, in fact, push me to my knees. There's no danger then of walking around high and mighty. I didn't think it as a gift, and I begged God to remove it. Three times I did that, and then God told me, what? My grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap, and I began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. And now I take limitations in stride. And with good cheer, these limitations that cut me down to size, like abuse and accidents and opposition and bad breaks, I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. That is the paradox of how we find strength in God. Not strength in ourselves, but reliance on God's strength. And Paul says, the weaker I become, the less I rely on myself, the greater my strength is as it comes from God. See, what happens is because of our sin nature, our default mode is what we'd call self-sufficiency. Anybody willing to agree and like be part of the AA group today? Because of our sin nature, 
our default mode is I can do this on my own. What is one of the first things kids say? All right, as kids are growing up, right? Like, no, I do it. No, I do it. Every single time, they want to be able to do it. And then they realize their own limitations. They find their own strengths, but then they also realize their limitations. And we're still learning that lesson on in through adulthood, aren't we? God wants us to rely on him. So what happens is rather than relying on the, the power of God's spirit inside of us, we try to do it on our own. So what happens then is that we get overwhelmed because we think we're supposed to be able to handle it. And we get to the point where we can't, and then we have a crisis of identity. I should be able to do this, and I can't. And we, we have this feeling of being overwhelmed. So here's a better phrase. So instead of telling people, God will never give you more than he, I'm going to suggest a better phrase. You guys ready for it? This is what you came for right here. Here's the better phrase. It's on the screen for you already. God will give you all the grace you need in every situation. God never promises that you'll never have more than you can handle, but he does promise to give you all the grace you need in every situation. So no matter how much suffering, no matter how deeply you hurt, the truth is God's grace will be enough for all your needs. So what this does is instead of propping up self-sufficiency, this rightly promotes our reliance upon God. Um, a couple years ago, my family and I went to a place called Camp Maranatha, Maranatha Bible Camp on the west side of the state. Anybody been there in the room? Maranatha Bible Camp? Okay, no, just me. That's okay. I feel very, very alone right now, but that's okay. A <laughs> uh, really great uh, camp that runs throughout basically the whole year, but especially in the summertime. My family went there for a week of vacation. They have all kinds of fun things that you can do there. They've got zip lines, and they've got uh, paddle boarding you can do out on Lake Michigan. So one of the things we wanted to try to tackle that day was the climbing wall. So my kids did this, and you know, my kids, you know, weigh like five pounds, and so they get harnessed up, and they scamper up the climbing wall. I'm like, that's pretty easy. I, I think I, can, I should be able to do that. So I get harnessed up, and uh, you can see the, the guy there is basically my belay. He's the counterweight, so that if I fall, he's there to catch me. I didn't notice it until just now, but he looks like he's straining in that picture. Um, <laughs> I'm not really sure. Um, but uh, so I start climbing up the wall, and as I climb up, he takes out some slack, so there's, there's very little slack. So if I do fall, it's not a very far fall. There was a couple times, uh, I got up to about this point on the wall, and I was gassed. I had no more left in the tank. <laughs> and uh, those, all those dreams and aspirations of flying to the top like they do at the Olympics, you know, speed climbing, that was not happening that day. Um, but I didn't want to let the wall defeat me, so I cheated a little bit. I got up as far as I could, and then I knew that the belay was holding me. He actually had a pretty, you know, there wasn't much slack at all. So I kind of just like let go of the handle holes. I just kind of like chilled out there for a few minutes, and he held me the whole time while I was there. I tried to get going again, and it didn't happen. So don't be disappointed in your pastor. That's as far as he got, all right, on the climb. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. So, uh, But I love that idea, though, that, that no matter what I needed, no matter what support I needed in the moment, the belay was there to take out the slack and be that support for me every single step of the way. I think that's a great picture of what God is saying to us through this, this uh, principle today, that no matter what you face, God's grace is sufficient in that moment for what you're facing. Like, that's the truth of God's word for us today. We don't always know what those situations are going to be. You know, so we'll begin to feel overwhelmed, but we have to trust and know that God's grace is going to be sufficient for this moment. That's really encouraging, knowing that there's uncertainty in our future. I feel like we're getting together every single Sunday going, like, what crazy things happened this week? Right? It's really encouraging to know, though, that no matter what comes, God's grace is sufficient for that. So let me run through a couple of possible scenarios through the different stages of our lives. So when you're young, maybe something happens to you. Maybe you're abused in some way. Maybe you have a loss of some kind. And it's overwhelming. We're not going to try to pretend that you should be able to handle that. We are going to acknowledge, though, that God's grace, as hard as it may be, God's grace is sufficient. We're going to fast forward a few years. Um, we'll skip past the high school and, and college years. Uh, we'll just say you get married and you have kids. And you have lots of kids. And I'm never going to call children something other than what Scripture calls them. The Bible calls children a blessing. But maybe you're overwhelmed by God's blessing. 
God's blessing, your blessing is so overwhelming, God. Thank you. I don't know how to handle it. And parenting can be really challenging, and it can be overwhelming. But I do know what? That God's grace is sufficient for what you're going through. And you don't know how you're going to, but eventually they do grow up and leave the house, and, uh, and God gets you through those moments, doesn't he? I, I've heard that uh, grandkids are the reward for not killing your own children, basically. Uh, so congratulations to those of you who are grandparents. God's grace is sufficient. But maybe then in the next season, maybe you have a health scare, or maybe a sudden loss of a job or job transition, or maybe a pandemic, how about? And we don't know how we're going get to get through. We don't, it's overwhelming to us, but guess what? God's grace is sufficient in those situations. And maybe you find yourself at a season where you're caring for aging parents. And again, God gives you all the grace you need for the situation you're going through. And maybe at one day, you've lost a loved one or you're facing death yourself. And I don't understand how it works, but it's like the perfect pour every single time. <laughs> I, I wish if someone has a device or something that's the perfect pour, if you can find an illustration for me, that'd be great. But just imagine the perfect pour every single time. The perfect amount every single time. That's how God's grace works in your life. That just when you need it, the right amount is poured out into your life. So, what is it for you? Uh, maybe your marriage. But I believe God will give you the grace that you need in the struggles in your marriage right now. Maybe you can relate to this. Maybe it's your kids starting school and feeling overwhelmed with a brand new school year. Are we wearing masks? Are we not wearing masks? Are we in person? Are we not in person? Maybe you're overwhelmed, but God's grace is what you need. Maybe you're unsure of the future. God will give you the grace that you need. Here's one that hit home for me. Um, we're in a huge season of transition as a church. Um, we've never been through this before. You know, we're super excited about it. If you don't know the history of our church, Evident will be 13 years old. Uh, coming up in a week or two. Uh, we stopped celebrating birthdays in church world. You cel celebrate 10 and then maybe 20, but you stop celebrating in the funerals. But, uh, but I know those. We've been around uh, for a little while. So the first 10 years of our church, um, it seemed overwhelming. We were portable, set up and tore down every single Sunday. Uh, but God gave us the grace that we needed for those seasons, didn't he? We bought this building, moved in. It seemed overwhelming, like lots going on, lots of change. But the past three years, God gives us grace we need for what we're going through. So I'm super excited about what's next, but it does mean change, doesn't it? We love this little cozy space. We love our little lobby, um, but it's going to mean some change. Those of you who sit in certain seats, you have to sit in different seats in the new space or whatever it is. Um, it's change, but guess what? What I firmly believe about this next season, what will God do? He will give us the grace we need for this new season, won't he? And he'll give us all that we need. So to whatever he wants us to do, he'll give us that grace, and he'll supply our needs. So, it's not God will give me more, God will never give me more than, I, than I, I can handle, so I need to toughen up and handle this. Something must be wrong with me. No, it's at times I will have more than I can handle, but I know my God will give me all the grace I need no matter what I'm going through. So um, you can almost say it this way. Um, the truth is God will never give you more than what he can handle. So let me wrap up with this story. Um, over Labor Day weekend, I got to spend some time at a family reunion. Uh, just so you guys know a little bit about me. Uh, my mom's maiden name is D.R.C. Uh, I've got a little bit of Irish in me. It's a great Irish name. D, I love how it's spelled, dude. D apostrophe A-R-C-Y. I'm not sure why they dropped some letters and added the apostrophe. I don't really know. But D.R.C. And so we got together at this family reunion. In my mom's side of the family, you're either a teacher an accountant, um, or a farmer. That's kind of the three options on my mom's side of the family. Um, and so we get together every year over Labor Day, and we spend time together, about 40 or so of us, and we just spend time uh, being together. The kids run around and play. And this particular year, a couple, uh, yeah, last weekend, uh, we were honoring my uncle uh, because he just retired last year from 50 years in the tax business as an accountant. 50 years. Do you think tax law has changed at all in 50 years? <laughs> it went from probably 1,000 pages to now, you know, 10,000 pages of tax law. Uh, back when they started, he was kind of telling us some of these stories. Uh, they, didn't have a, they didn't have copy machines. They didn't have printers. So they hand wrote 
all the tax returns <laughs> for every single year. Can you imagine doing that? They eventually invented, uh, what's the, the paper called? Carbon copy paper, where it at least makes one copy of it. They eventually got their own copy machine, which they said took up about the size of this room right here. Um, they, they would find themselves driving uh, to Port Huron from Marlette, Michigan to Port Huron to make copies and things like that. But all the things that have changed over the years. But what was significant was listening to my uncle's siblings, so my other aunts and uncles, um, give honor to their older brother. And so they talked about his integrity as a person. Uh, they talked about his endurance and his patience. How to do something, to do anything for 50 years <laughs> requires all of those things. And then I won't forget, this was the most impactful moment for me. Um, so one of his younger brothers said toward the end, he said, I couldn't imagine having a brother any better than you. I know this doesn't happen at most family gatherings. I'm not sure what your family gathering was like uh, over Labor Day, but, but this is what we got to spend time doing. So I, he said, I can't imagine having a better brother than you. And that just really impacted me. I have two older brothers. And to think about that support and that love and that closeness of, of siblings. But then he shared this verse out of Proverbs, Proverbs 18, 24. He said, There's a man of, If a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. What's it a reference to? Who's it referring to? The answer is Jesus. When in doubt, when in doubt, the answer is Jesus. And I just, I love that. I love this foreshadowing of the book of Proverbs into the New Testament, into the person of Jesus, that no matter what happens, there is a friend. There is one who is closer to you than even the closest brother. So maybe you have close siblings, maybe you don't. But Jesus is closer than all of those relationships. So as we close, I just want to encourage you, no matter what you're going through, God's grace is enough to get you through. So you guys go ahead and stand with me as we pray. Um, as we uh, close in prayer, I want to share with you guys a couple of prayer requests that you guys can be praying for, for our church. I want to encourage you to pray, pray for our church family the next couple of weeks. Uh, this is a season of transition. Um, it's something new for us. Pray. Uh, for our church in this season. Uh, pray for a couple of specific things. You can pray for my brother in Christ, Cam Walters, and uh, our tech team. So what's going to happen at the end of this service is you guys are all going to help us uh, stack these chairs because this week, uh, this is going to be a construction zone. And then by next Sunday, they need to put it back together. Uh, but you can pray specifically. Thank thankfully, our project is on time, but because of supply chain issues, we're, there's all kinds of stuff going on. So there's a video wall that we're waiting for, for that new space. We don't know where it is. We have no idea. It might be in a port in LA. It might still be in the country where it's being made. Who knows? Um, uh, another thing, small thing, but a soundboard. Yeah. Uh, we it's ordered okay. a soundboard. We have no idea where, it's, where it is. This is okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, and other things like that. You can just imagine, though. We just pray for those things. Pray. And we don't need that stuff, right? I mean, this is, we get to do this. We're We're blessed but just some things that can cause stress. And so you can pray for those things um, the next couple of weeks. So let's pray together. God, thank you for your grace. And I just thank you for reminding us today of this, this important fact um, that we will at times face things we can't, we can't handle. God, my prayer is right now for those in the room that are overwhelmed and feeling crushed by something. It's a fear, it's a doubt, it's a hurt, it's a pain. And God, would you right now just pour your grace into their life? Would you please remind them of your love, of your plan, of your goodness? God, just remind us of your, your work in the world. Uh, we just thank you for all you're doing, God. Thank you for your grace. It's overwhelming. Jesus, thank you for being closer than anybody possibly could. Uh, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.